Good afternoon and welcome to today's event. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. I will now hand it over to Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, Lana Popham. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. I'm joined by Provincial Health Officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry today to provide an update on the future of mink farming in British Columbia and to announce our government is beginning a process to phase out the province's mink farming industry due to ongoing public health risks associated with COVID-19. This decision follows the advice of public health officials, animal health experts, infectious disease experts about managing the threat of the virus for both workers at the farms and the broader public and follows a BC Center for Disease Control Risk Assessment that advises COVID-19 variants in mink pose a, a risk to human health, which will continue in the years ahead. The process includes a permanent ban on breeding mink, a permanent ban on live mink on farms by April 2023, and all operations seizing completely with all pelts sold by April 2025. We communicated that information to the nine mink farm operators in BC earlier today. And we know that this is a very challenging day for those farmers, but we are going to be assisting them in transition. And we know that it is in the best interest of public health that this, this decision was made. Our government will work with affected farmers and workers to help them pursue other farming businesses or job opportunities that support their families. The farmers will also be eligible for benefits through existing government funded income protection programs to assist them through this transition. The decision to phase out mink farming follows outreach, meetings, and ongoing discussion with public health officials and mink producers about managing the threat of the virus since the first outbreak at a BC mink farm in December and follows the public health order Dr. Henry issued in July, placing a moratorium on any new mink farms in BC and capping the amount of animals at existing numbers. Our government has carefully considered this decision and we've consulted with the PHO and Fraser Health Authority to determine the health risks and the best path forward. The decision to phase out mink farms is based on these public health risks and is recommended to keep British Columbians safe. With that in mind, I'd like to ask, ask Dr. Henry to provide some information on the public health recommendations and following that we'll both be available for questions. Thank you very much and good afternoon. As we are all keenly aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has been very difficult for many, many people um, and many businesses across this province. People have become severely ill and we know that we have lost over 2,000 of our community members, our family members, our friends. Not one of us has been immune to the health, the social or the economic impacts of this pandemic. And my priority along with my public health colleagues has always been to minimize the impact of the pandemic on the health and safety of all of us here in BC. And that means when necessary, putting restrictions and orders in place to try and stem risky transmission. Late last year, we saw a number of COVID-19 outbreaks on mink farms and three of the nine mink farms so far have had uh, challenging outbreaks that has led to transmission between mink, um, between mink and humans and humans back to mink. Over the subsequent months since the uh, first uh, two outbreaks happened, Fraser Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, WorkSafe BC, and our on the ground public health teams have taken many steps in concert with the workers and producers to control this hazard and reduce the potential for even more transmission for, to other people, other animals. We did an in-depth risk assessment in concert with national experts, international experts, and it really told us that the risk of transmission back and forth between humans and mink would continue. That risk, uh, which uh, the risk assessment, which came out in uh, spring last year, after the first two outbreaks had cleared 
and it gave us an idea of what were the conditions that were in place. And the risk was thought to be low. And by low, we meant that we would likely be dealing with uh, one to two outbreaks per year in the small number of farms that we have here in British Columbia. Since that time, however, we have had another uh, outbreak on, a, on an additional farm that has not been able to be cleared despite increased biosecurity measures, ongoing testing, vaccination of staff, and the many, many different um, measures that we've put in place. This has meant that we have uh, led to um, Fraser Health having to put in very specific uh, orders for all of the mink farms to try and reduce the risk that was persistent. And as well, this past summer, I put on a provincial health uh, officer order to um, ban any further, uh, to restrict mink farming to those farms that were in existence and to prevent any additional animals being brought onto those farms. Currently, and again, unfortunately, our assessment has not changed. We have ongoing concerns with one farm where transmission continues between mink and humans and back. And we have uh, ongoing quarantine orders on three farms. And so mink farming continues to be a health hazard, in my opinion, and in the opinion of my public health colleagues. We don't see that assessment changing in the short term. And in addition, there's concern that there's increased risk due to ongoing persistence of infected mink, which indicates the higher potential for mink being a reservoir of virus than was previously assessed. Workers being infected from mink despite vaccination and the many biosecurity measures that we have in place. And I must say as well, these are very challenging. Wearing personal protective equipment when you're around the animals, um, taking the additional measures can be a challenging thing for workers to, to adhere to. And we know that that's um, part of the concerns that we have. The transmission potential from humans to mink and mink to humans from breakthrough cases of COVID-19 in spite of vaccination of workers is a risk. As well, we know that the presence of our, the highly transmissible Delta variant now in the human population is the primary strain that we're seeing in BC. And we, we worry about the threat of it being introduced into mink farms. There's also concern of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 from escaped mink to wild animals and risk that mutations of the, of the virus can lead to additional variants of concern as we see when this virus gets into a large population and replicates um, in multiple, multiple animals at the same time. And as I mentioned, the challenges with maintaining the strict biosecurity measures and testing and monitoring programs that are required over the longer term. I absolutely acknowledge that the, the hard work the farmers and workers on these farms have been doing, along with our colleagues in the Ministry of Agriculture, with the, uh, the support of WorkSafe BC and our public health workers. The important and challenging work that they have been doing over this past year and a half has contributed significantly to reducing the risk from what it otherwise would have been. Unfortunately, given the continuing evolution of the pandemic and the continuing additions to scientific knowledge, our estimation of risk of a health hazard persisting is such that these efforts cannot fully mitigate the risks that we're seeing from mink farming here in BC. We are, as I presented yesterday, in a fragile time in the pandemic. We have ongoing transmission in communities with a very highly transmissible and more virulent strain. And we cannot afford to let these additional risks go unchecked. These are absolutely not decisions we make lightly. And we have been working very hard with the producers, with our partners over the past 18 months. And we've reviewed the scientific data and the reality of what has happened on farms here in BC and the ongoing risk that we are seeing. It is all of this together that make it uh, important and I fully support the government's decision to initiate now this phase out of mink farms in our province. I do want to thank the farmers and producers and workers and everyone who's been part of this response effort for engaging so fully in this work and we will be there to support you as we go through this next few months and the next uh, period of transition. 
to reduce and, and stop the mink farming here in BC. Thank you very much and we're happy to take questions. Thank you very much. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question goes to Lisa Eusta, City News. Lisa, please go ahead. I have a question, unfortunately, not about the mink, but it is fascinating and we are doing that story. But for Dr. Henry, um, we are looking at religious services and there's a church in Abbotsford and, and I've spoken to them that had um, 40 cases and 11 they're staying in hospital. I'm wondering, is there anything more that public health can do to support churches or are these transmissions mostly happening outside of church services and in gatherings you know, that people are having in their homes or other places? Uh, so we are here to talk about mink today. Uh, having said that, uh, as we know, every uh, outbreak is investigated and supported by local public health. And I know that Fraser Health has been working um, particularly. We've seen a number of clusters related to um, gatherings in Fraser East, and uh, this is one of them. Absolutely, we have uh, guidance out for faith leaders, and I know that many of them are following it. I mentioned this uh, earlier this week in, in remarks about the importance of adhering to that guidance, especially as we're heading into respiratory season and in those areas like Fraser East where transmission is highest. There are additional restrictions in that area. Things like mask wearing are important, keeping distance, making sure that people can um, participate remotely and are not um, compelled to come into a religious uh, gathering. Those are important. And yes, we have seen transmission primarily in, in private events and gatherings where people are not paying attention to uh, things like masking and staying away when they're not feeling well. And of course, we know that that puts people who are unvaccinated at greatest risk and it puts our seniors and elders at risk. Do you have a follow-up, Lisa? I do, and I promise we are going to talk a lot about mink today on our station. The other question is for a colleague regarding capacity limits in venues and some people still feeling there's a letter that was written to us, that was shared with us that I think was shared with you with the rickshaw in particular, being concerned that they don't feel like it's being even Stephen of what is being required at places like larger arenas like Rogers versus what smaller venues can do. And I'm wondering if you have anything to say to those operators who are feeling like they're not getting a fair shake. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what ledger you're referring to, but uh, uh, capacity limits are, are at a specific level in, uh, in facilities across the province. And there are additional restrictions in some areas where we know transmission is still high. For the next question, we go to Richard Zussman, Global News. Richard, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Henry, I'm hoping we're not in the pandemic anymore by the time we get to 2023 or 2025. So can you explain why there is a phase out here and not an immediate uh, ban on all live mink? And what should operators do between now and 2023 uh, that would alleviate some of these real dire circumstances you mentioned in terms of, you know, the virus being passed on from a mink to human that could lead to an evolution in the virus where the vaccines are not effective. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start and then I know Minister Poffin will have some, some comments, but just to say that there's a, there's a cycle in the breeding of mink, so I have learned, and we're at the point right now uh, where the animals are, are um, mostly about to be pelted. Um, so we have some provision for a very small number of uh, animals to be kept as breeding stock. We have uh, the, the new regulations will prohibit any further breeding within BC, but uh, some producers may elect to, uh, to be able to sell some of their breeding stock. We know that some of the breeding stock here in BC has a, has a high value. So that gives them a period of time to, uh, to sell outside of BC a limited number of, of animals as breeding stock. Um, we feel that we can mitigate that risk for that small number of animals that will be around for at the very longest, April of 2023. Um, so that will be much reduced from the numbers that are in, in the province at the moment. 
um, many producers may opt not to keep any live animals uh, through the pelting season, which uh, ends in the next few months. Um, and the extra two years just gives time um, for the producers to get the best um, price for the pelts that they have on site right now. Having said that, there is one farm that is currently under quarantine, as I mentioned, and so th there is no movement of live animals or pelts or any of the materials on or off that farm because it has um, increased uh, numbers of, of animals and humans who have tested positive recently. And there are two farms where there are quarantine orders from the provincial vet on movement of pelts because they have been from uh, contaminated farms in the past. So there's a, a lot of work to be done to work with each of the producers about what their options are in the, in the coming months. Thank you for the question. So just to add to what Dr. Henry has stated, um, there is a lot of work for uh, our government to do with uh, the nine farms. Um, we know that there will be some transition that will be needed for workers from those farms and we are um, absolutely available to work with them uh, as much as they need. We have some insurance programs to help them uh, recover from from the situation um, and we also want to work with the the nine farms to see if they would like to transition into a different type of farming um, but my ministry will be working with them very very closely Richard do you have a follow-up there have been concerns raised from the SPCA and others around mink farms and cruelty towards animals you know, this announcement is all about the spread of COVID, but, you know, what and what factor does cruelty of animals have to play here? Um, and, you know, as we work our way through COVID, like, is there a chance this industry uh, could return if transmission of the virus is no longer an issue? Or, or does cruelty towards animals also come into play as part of this decision? Yeah, so um, there are many... <laughs> many different aspects that we look at from a public health perspective around uh, risk and this uh, our decisions around these farms um, we uh, take a, a view that is full, solely focused on the health hazard and um, my colleagues in uh, agriculture my public health colleagues in the ground uh, it really is about one the health of the animals but also uh, the health of the humans in particular that's my focus so this decision um, really is about that. Um, the broader question of whether there should be fur farming at all in the province is an important question. It's not what has factored into these decisions today and I don't know Minister if you want to comment on on the broader issue. Thank you. Well, I think I'll just reiterate that today was a decision that was based on public health. Uh, our government took advice from the public health officials and um, we're very appreciative of the working relationship that we have. Our next question goes to Alyssa Tebow, CTV. Alyssa, please go ahead. Oh, hi, this is uh, for Minister Popham. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, Cedar Valley Farms, uh, the cattle farm that now has had its license suspended. Uh, my first question is uh, whether, Minister, you, you've seen video of, uh, of the abuse allegations that, that have surfaced. One, do you have a reaction to the video or the claims in general? Uh, I haven't seen the video, but uh, I am aware of the alleged abuse um, that has transpired. Uh, the Milk Marketing Board informed me last week. I've had discussions with the BC Dairy Association and my ministry has been working with the BC SPCA. Um, my concern when I first heard about the issue was that the, it was a, around the welfare of the animals on that farm. And so our ministry ensured that there would be an observer on that farm until the investigation was complete and um, until that investigation is complete, I, I am unable to comment on anything else. Alyssa, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, so there was a previous uh, animal cruelty case involving cattle a few years ago in BC, and according to the court documents, one of the uh, workers involved who was convicted of animal cruelty was given a specific exemption to continue working at Cedar Valley Farms. So I wanted to know if the Ministry A was aware 
of this and whether it would be part of the investigation. Um, we have been made aware that that might be a possibility, but until the investigation completes, we won't be able to be comment commenting on that. But I think um, I can be very clear that uh, our government believes that anyone who is abusing animals needs to be held accountable. Our next question goes to Terry Theodore, Canadian Press. Terry, please go ahead. Hi, this is for the minister. Um, I'm wondering uh, what kind of financial help or compensation the BC government will be giving. I, I know that you said there was insurance, but, but I mean, th these farmers are losing their livelihood. Yes, and so um, we do have uh, insurance programs that are built into our, our ministry, and the, we, these are early discussions. Uh, we've made uh, the, main, the nine mink farms aware that that's an option for them. Uh, over the next coming weeks, they will have to make different decisions about um, how, how they're going to proceed until 2025. And so uh, the issue of compensation and landing on a number isn't a, a possibility right now. We don't really know what is before us, but the one thing that is sure is that we'll be working closely with them. Terry, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, so uh, do we have an, an idea about how many minks, mink, are on these farm and on these nine farms and if in the end any of them will be culled? So there's nine mink farms uh, in BC and there's about 318,000 mink that populate those farms. Uh, some of those farms may choose to depopulate and those that are able may wish to um, sell the pelts, but those decisions haven't been made yet, but we look forward to working with the industry to, to help them through this. Just to, just to clarify, um, you know, the, the 300 and some th thousand mink that are on the farm currently, the vast majority of those mink are at the point where they are being pelted. So that is the purpose of the mink farms is to, raise mink for their fur and and so that is occurring right now as that process goes through there may be some mink as i mentioned who will be kept on some farms uh, as breeding stock although the breeding will not be allowed to occur here in bc but it is a product uh, that may be of value for some farms so those are the the details that will need to be worked out for each farm the next question goes to liam Britton, cbc liam please go ahead Hi there. Uh, do we have a sense uh, in all how many workers are going to uh, lose jobs as a result of this? And do you know how many of those workers have become infected? And do we know what their health uh, outcomes have been? And um, can you speak to, um, you know, the efforts and costs that farmers have incurred uh, as an, in an effort to mitigate risk uh, over this uh, these past 18 months? Yeah, there's about approximately 200 workers, including families that uh, work and own the farms. So it's not a, a huge number. Um, and some of those workers are temporary farm workers that come in uh, with specialized skills at specific periods of time. So there are higher risk periods of time in the life cycle of the mink when they're breeding, uh, where there's uh, more contact between workers and the, the, the animals uh, just after the, the, the poults are born. And then there's, uh, or the, the uh, Kits are born, sorry. And then, this is what I'm learning. And then there's a, a, a more contact and a higher risk period right about now uh, when the animals are being pelted for their furs, which is the purpose of the mink farms. So uh, there has been a transmission to uh, a, a little bit under, uh, about a dozen uh, humans have tested positive on the, on the three farms where we've had um, where we've had human cases and there has been, uh, I don't know the absolute number of mink, but there have been many mink that have tested positive on the three farms as well over a period of time. One of the farms uh, opted to uh, not uh, breed and to stop production, um, that one of the affected farms. Uh, the second affected farm uh, had some transmission over a period of months and uh, then cleared the virus. And then this third farm that I mentioned has had a, a challenging and we've had recent human and mink infections on that farm. So it has been an intense amount of work 
for public health, for my the uh, environmental health inspectors and uh, medical health officers from Fraser Health who have inspected these farms on a routine basis. It has been a challenge for us uh, in terms of working with Ministry of Agriculture, our provincial veterinarian, to make sure that the uh, the uh, animals are kept safely and a testing protocol. And so some of those costs have been borne by um, public health, our public health lab to do the testing. We've been doing whole genome sequencing so we understand what strains are passing between mink, between humans and mink and, and back and forth. Uh, the Animal uh, Ministry of Agriculture has had inspectors who have been working very closely with the farms to make sure we have the best possible biosecurity measures in place at the farms. And WorkSafe BC inspectors and prevention officers have been involved routinely with the farms as well. So it has been a tremendous uh, cost to all of us. And that is one of the factors that we looked at in this. And despite having a very intensive and, and the best possible um, measures that we could do about making sure that all of the workers who had contact with mink were vaccinated and vaccinated early, making sure that we had a, a testing program in the environment and of humans on a routine basis, um, and making sure that we did ongoing inspections to support these biosecurity measures. So it has been a, a difficult and challenging time for the farm workers um, and for uh, our teams to try and manage um, given a small number of farms and the other intense pressures that we've been under. So that has been part of the challenge. And as I mentioned, it's really difficult for the workers to continue to wear uh, respirators, the personal protective equipment that's needed in that high intense environment where there's a lot of animals and, and uh, potentially a lot of uh, virus circulating. And uh, during the summer, it was a very challenging time for workers. As you know, we had um, pretty intense heat in, uh, and that led to um, difficulty in wearing protective equipment, which you can imagine. And that's probably one of the reasons why we continued to see transmissions on, on uh, one of the farms anyway. So it, it is, it's been difficult and that has factored into our risk assessment. You know, how much resources can we uh, continue to put into this? Um, can we uh, cost recover some of those resources, particularly around the, the uh, testing and uh, how easy is it for workers and how safe is it for workers to continue to take those measures that are needed to keep them from transmitting virus back and forth to mink and, and vice versa. So really important considerations. Liam, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so uh, part of the concern is, is mink um, uh, perhaps being a potential source of variant uh, of the coronavirus. Is there any sign that mink here or elsewhere have created or led to any variants, um, even if they're not variants of concern? And, and what about, is there something about mink in particular that makes them particularly concerning as reservoirs or as potential uh, generators of variants? Yeah, so um, both of those are, are yes. Um, Denmark was the first country that had uh, issues with uh, transmission on mink farms, and they did have a number of variants arise that were transmitted from the mink to humans and vice versa. Um, and we have had that here. So they, it, mink are un somewhat unique, but we also see ferrets, uh, cats, also are susceptible to COVID. But the, the, the um, really important factor is the numbers that you have in a small space together. So we've said this many, many times, when this virus gets into a population and spreads and, and uh, uh, replicates in large numbers, that's when mutations arise. And these mutations uh, can confer an advantage to that virus. We saw this in, uh, in countries where we had a lot of spread of the virus in humans. Um, in India, for example, where there was an explosive outbreak, that's where the Delta virus uh, variant arose and, uh, and it started to spread rapidly around the world. So unlike ferrets and cats, which aren't bred in large numbers in close contact together on farms like this, we don't see that, that intense pressure and replication pressure that leads to mutations. But on mink farms, where you have large numbers of animals in uh, small spaces together, um, and the virus can spread very, very quickly between the animals. 
So that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, there is concern that we can get new muta mutations arise when you have 100,000 animals on a farm or, um, and, it can, and, and the virus gets in. And we have seen um, mink viruses spread to humans and they are, uh, the whole genome sequen sequencing shows that they're unique to the strains that we're seeing circulating in the population. And we have seen it the other way as well, that the mink have been infected with the human strains that come from uh, uh, the population. So these are all things that we take into account. And we've seen that uh, the science in, uh, in other countries where mink farming, and intense mink farming has happened as well, that they have seen mutations. Thankfully, we've not seen a variant of concern arise in the mink farms here. But uh, the concern that we have is as we're getting more transmissible variants, particularly Delta, and we've seen how it has changed what we need to do um, to protect humans from transmission, um, even with very high rates of vaccination, that that type of a, a variant arising in a mink farm could be, um, could be tremendously harmful. So those are the considerations that that we've taken into effect. I think it's things that we've learned about, you know, there are many animals that can get infected with COVID. Um, thankfully, we don't see it in, in poultry and, and birds um, like we do with influenza, for example. So uh, it is a, a risk that's somewhat unique in terms of the uh, farmed animals. For the next question, we go to Mary Brook, Island Social Trends. Hi, yeah, a couple of questions. The um, earlier you mentioned broader wildlife might be um, exposed to COVID because of the mink infections, and that would have broader implications for, you know, BC wildlife in general. What animals would be susceptible and how would the minks be in contact with them? Yeah, so we, we have on occasion found uh, escaped minks either on farm or close to farms, and they uh, can therefore spread. Um, to other wildlife uh, that they're in contact with, primarily wild mink or other uh, similar uh, animals in, in the wild, even cats, um, that could then spread it to other. Uh, we know that deer, we know that dogs, we know that uh, there's a number of, of animals, many we don't yet know, uh, that can be infected with this virus as well. Do you have a follow-up, Mary? Um, yes, thanks. So. Um, this is kind of a first example of transitioning an industry um, because of COVID, and it's sort of similar to what's going on in the um, environmental talks, even in COP26, about transitioning entire industries because of um, moving them in, out of oil producing into uh, green. And so I'm just looking at this, um, Minister Popham, from a, a financial point of view. Do you have kind of a ballpark figure of what it costs to, you know, sort of in a sense, hand pick an industry and say, okay, we're going to transition you? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm not able to give a figure at this time, but um, within our uh, very productive food system in British Columbia, we have a lot of agricultural opportunities. Uh, in fact, we have 12,000 jobs that are available annually. So um, we're hoping that it, for the workers, we will be able to assist them and to transition into uh, a, a different type of farming. And as far as the, the actual farms, the owners of the farms, those are, those are we're, it's too early to, to really know what they want to do, whether they want to transition into a different type of operation, perhaps a food production operation, um, or, you know, we, we don't know we don't know what they're going to to want to do with their future, but we're going to be there assisting them along the way. For our next question, we go to Peter Mitham, Country Life. Peter, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so, taking note that this is this decision is um, being positioned as a public health uh, decision, um, have to ask if similar to others. Um, if this was responding to the um, calls for a ban on fur farms, um, and also if it uh, sets a precedent for um, responding to other concerns of activists, particularly uh, the request call for mandatory surveillance of um, farms such as Cedar Valley and third party audits for livestock operations to, I suppose, um, address not only animal welfare issues, but um, potential future public health risks. So just to be, be clear, this is a decision that the minister and her ministry have made, the government has made. 
um, my job is to provide the advice about the health risk and the, the health hazard that we have been trying to manage in, in partnership with the, the producers, with uh, agriculture and others, as I've mentioned. And so a provincial health officer order was put in place in the summer um, in, uh, to uh, um, limit uh, the movement or the increase in numbers of animals on the mink farms given what we were seeing in terms of risk and this has allowed government time to make the decision so it is absolutely uh, the minister's decision. You have a follow-up Peter. Oh sorry minister if you'd like to go ahead please proceed yes thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's nice to hear your voice on the line today. Um, yes, and also I'll reiterate that this decision was based on public health. Um, on any given day, we have a lot of British Columbians who, who voice their opinions on, on many different things. Um, but uh, as we've worked through this issue and taken the advice of the public health officers, I can assure you that this was based on a public health decision. Peter, do you have a follow-up? Uh, so, um, so there will be no, uh, is the minister saying then that there will be no, she will not be responding to um, calls for mandatory surveillance on other livestock farms uh, or third party audits to mitigate public health risks and animal welfare concerns? Uh, well, what I can say is that um, animal, animal welfare is of always great concern to our government and we're always moving forward with consultation with industry uh, and stakeholders to see how we can better improve that. Um, but today's decision is based on public health. Thank you, everyone. That concludes today's event.